Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Shades of Entrepreneurship. This is your host, Mr. Gabriel Flores. Today, I'm here with an author of Super Bad, Fred Joyle. How are we doing? Good. It's super bold. Super oh, bad. Super is bold. A super bold. Is actually, a funny movie. Comedy. Right. Yeah. My, <laughs> one of my favorite comedies of all time. Yeah. This is about boldness, uh, not about uh, high school hijinks. Unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> so Fred, let's let's introduce the listeners to Fred. Who uh, give him a little quick background, education, career path. Let them know what we're talking about today. So uh, started off in the ad business. My first real job was as a copywriter in an ad agency after a series of other jobs, uh, and then spun that into a business that a friend of mine and I started that was called One Eight Hundred Dentist, which became the largest dentist referral service in the country and had about a 30 year run and generated uh, over a billion dollars in revenue in aggregate over those 30 years, uh, started with $30,000. So we, uh, we leveraged it pretty good and we didn't know what we were doing. Uh, so we were, we, we called it a series of survivable mistakes um, <laughs> was, is how we got where we were. Uh, Cause we had to invent every aspect of the business, but, and eventually what happened is I learned a lot about patient behavior and how to create a, a great experience for those patients, how to turn what were, were our leads into accepting patient patients who accepted treatment. Yeah. And so I wrote a couple of books on it. I started lecturing on it. Uh, it turned into this whole other career for me within the industry. And then Along the way, I realized how much uh, I had evolved from a very shy and underconfident person to a very bold and confident person. Uh, and people would say, how, how did you change? How did you get this way? Because we thought boldness was kind of innate. And so I figured, I analyzed how I did it, and I analyzed a lot of what I learned. And it, it basically wrote a book about everything I wish I knew at 20 years old that took me to 40 or 50 to learn. And, uh, and that's what super bold is, is how to cultivate the superpower of boldness, how to build your, your confidence and, and boldness to remarkable levels much more quickly than I did and have a systematic way to keep building it and expanding your comfort zone wider and wider and wider the rest of your life and chasing your dreams, you know, not turning into somebody else, but bringing the full you to whatever situation you're in. And so that's, that's where my passion is now is, is talking about this superpower and how you develop it. Love so that's, that. that's where I am. And the book came out in October of 2020. Excellent. Now I would love, let's, let's take a step back. So I, I would love to kind of hear a little bit more how we, how you, your, your trajectory essentially went from, you know, the 1-800 dentist to, to writing a book. Now you mentioned kind of in the healthcare world. So it sounds like you were in the healthcare world in the past. Uh, you know, I had not worked specifically in healthcare. I was just, I worked for an ad agency and it was a general ad agency. So we had oral wheat bread and we had Miller beer and we had a, a Arizona bank. We had a bunch of clients. And so I was writing for, for all different clients, but I, I learned how to communicate with, you know, audio visually. I mean, we, you know, TV and radio commercials are a phenomenal creative discipline because it's got to work in 29 half and a half seconds or it's yeah. junk, Good right? Point. 33 seconds, 32 seconds doesn't work. If you can't get to your point until it hits 32, you're done for. So, and the radio is 59 and a half seconds. So I got really good at that and how to, uh, you know, and then we created tons of advertising. And, and then I brought that skill to 800 Dennis because we built our entire business starting in radio, but then moving to television advertising. And we spent half a billion dollars in advertising over the life of the business. Wow. Uh, and, and so and it was all we, we there wasn't good data tracking in those days. And we, we had we didn't when we started, there wasn't even an Excel sheet. <laughs> to, so we we were learning and growing with our data mining, but we got really good at it. Um, and but and we just sort of fell into healthcare. The formula worked for dentists. It was the value of a new patient was worth what we were charging them, which had a profit margin in it. 
Yep. Uh, but it was only because we were really good at creating and placing advertising. You know, there's two ways to get screwed in advertising, write the wrong ad or go to an agency that overcharges you and runs the ad in the wrong place. Uh, and we, so we kept control of those two things for the whole run of the business. Uh, or we wouldn't have been profitable. We would have just folded the tent because it would, it, would have, it was only like a 15% margin business. So we didn't, we didn't have room to play. We couldn't, we couldn't lose 10 of those 15 points and still yep. survive. You know, this is, this is a great, I think, learning opportunity for the listeners. How did you kind of scale or, or advertise 1-800-DENTIST? How, how, how do you, what, let's talk about the importance of advertising. Yeah, I, I, and I, it goes to this basic thing is, uh, no, nothing happens in business till somebody sells something. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and, and, it, and you can have the greatest product in the world and, and the history of business, business is writ large with this, where the superior product is not effectively marketed and the second place product wins by a landslide and actually wipes out the better, so let's say better technological uh, uh, product uh the, the 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 one i always remember was is sony with their uh I forget what they is something max okay it was you know the oh yeah versus vhs yep. right and they made it proprietary and it and it was better than vhs in quality but they, they, nobody else could build a box with it so what happened is uh 15 electronics companies all built VHSs and distributed them. Sony just ate it. Um, Betamax. I knew I would Betamax, eventually remember there it that. Is. Yep. Yep. Um, but that's, and that's just, that's strategically wrong because you're forcing them to buy your proprietary park product. And Apple's done a pretty good job of that, but they also, they're, they're not the dominant player in the market so much as with a lot of products as they are the most, financially successful but it's because of their marketing of that their and marketing is the box right yeah. the billboard the the tagline the logo all all of these things and then incredible tv commercials i mean they they broke through the mac with a super bold uh, super bowl commercial which yeah. was super bold of them to do but they were just attacking ibm and said yeah you know, we, we are the new desktop. Um, and, and that's what drives your business. If you don't have good marketing, which includes good messaging, you will fail in the marketplace. Uh, you, you will be out competed against by somebody who invests in the marketing. And a lot of that is just coming up with that simple, unique message about your product. A lot of people fail about that. The number of business, I coach several businesses. And the first thing I, I say is, tell me what you do. And they'll go on for 20 minutes. And I'll say, you know what's interesting? That took 20 minutes and I'm not sure what you do, <laughs> <laughs> okay? You, you blab too much without telling me what exactly I should care about. Um, about this what you know it's some people they invent these businesses that that's a, a solution looking for a problem right yes and yep. and uh it's it's a real trap to think oh well i would really like this you know uh i would i would love to be able to buy uh dungeons and dragons characters you know it's like i think this could be a billion dollar business well i don't think it can <laughs> you know but because you like dungeons and dragons everybody else doesn't play yep. All right. you know there's a small segment of the population that does it so but just you can have a niche but aim for it yeah uh, and be real clear that how your that your niche is big enough and the niche wants what you have yeah um i mean we discovered in the first day with 800 dentists that there was a need we ran some radio ads in day one in Los Angeles. We just had 20 doctors on the program. We got 50 phone calls the first day. So first off, we said, wow, wow this could work. Yeah. So what do you do? You spend more in advertising. That's all we did. Recruit more doctors, spend more in advertising. There was no more refinement to do at that point except grow. Then you start refining it. Refine what you say on the phone. Refine what you say in the TV spot. 
we ran the one TV spot for a year when we switched to TV, same spot, because it kept banging away. It didn't, we didn't need to create a giant campaign. One simple, clear spot told people what we did. And people get very involved in being clever and creative and they don't, they don't move the needle because they got too clever. Yep. Very true. You know, you mentioned a few things that are very important for the listeners to know. One, don't go looking for a solution is, is prime. You know, I, I talk about that often on this podcast as an entrepreneur, if you want to be a successful entrepreneur, find a problem and then create a solution for the problem. Don't find a solution yeah. for a problem that doesn't exist. And particularly, and you also mentioned as well, don't go, go looking for a problem that's going to suit only your needs as an individual, right? Yeah. Uh, do some market research, you know, make sure you're ensuring that the problem you're solving is, is a large problem enough that's going to provide value to the consumer, right? That they're going to want to purchase it. Now, you kind of been talking about like advertising and marketing interchangeably. Is there a difference between advertising and marketing or are they relatively the same? I make a really clear dis distinction um, is because to me, advertising uh, and, and, and the way you should be thinking about it in your business, advertising is using a specific medium to tell, you know, radio, television, Google ads, Facebook ads, LinkedIn ads, your website, using a medium to tell people who you are, what you do and why they should want it from particularly you. Marketing is every single thing that you do that it tells people who you are, what you do, and why they should want it from you. It's everything that they experience about your brand. It's like I said, it can be the box. It can be customer service. Uh, it could be your phone number. It could be, you know, the, the, the images on your website. It could be your, you know, the videos you put on YouTube, you know, all, all of those things and then, and, you know, in healthcare, I talk about, it's like everything they see, taste, touch, hear, and smell affects case acceptance, yep. positively or negatively. Nothing true. is neutral. And that, and so marketing is much broader. It's all about what is that customer experience from start to finish that makes them want it from you. That, that is a great point. In fact, I was actually in a strategy meeting just the other day. And we were talking about branding and marketing for a specific program. And one of our pieces showed a video of a, you know, a patient receiving their a diagnosis and it came to them via email. Right. And I'm like, do we want to highlight the fact that that result was came through email, right. On, a, on an advertising, because the perception, right. Might be a little different, even though that might in fact be the true case. Right. And that might be the patient pathway, right. That, that, that's that perception. Right? It's like yeah. you're kind of mentioning um, the worst thing a person can do in advertising is say the wrong message or hire the wrong advertisement. If you say yeah. the wrong message in healthcare in particular, you're, you're losing and you're mentioning it, right? And those case volumes and patients coming in. If you, if you upset, you know, a mother or father, you're losing the entire family. You know, you're not you're losing all the patients from the family. They're going to go to a different healthcare system in general. Right. Now you kind of mentioned the, the Super Bowl book, how it was created and um, how you started it, you know, discussing how, you, you started to find your boldness, but this isn't your first book, is it? No, I wrote two books specifically for the dental industry. Uh, the first one was called Everything is Marketing, obviously based on that premise that everything that you do either increases or decreases case acceptance. And, uh, and it was called Everything is Marketing, the Ultimate Strategy for Dental Practice Growth. And, I, and a third of it was advertising, but two thirds of it was all about all of the other stuff. What do you? How how is the patient received? How are they greeted? What do they see? What do they hear? What are you saying? What is the team saying? What is the team wearing? What kind of lighting do you have? All of those things affect it. I mean, a, a typical example of this that people just they they don't piece it together. A lot of times in healthcare, uh, is when a dentist renovates their reception area their own patients start spending more money. Oh, interesting. Now that seems like that you, you just say, well, that makes no sense. And of course, baseline of all marketing advertising is people are not rational. They're emotional. Very true. They need rational explanations for why they made an emotional decision, but they are, the emotions are driving that decision. Environmental experience 
creates that desire, that greater comfort in accepting treatment. People, you know, they have to trust you and they have to value the dentistry. If it has a nice reception area, that increases the value that they think they're getting of the dentistry and it makes them a little more comfortable. And, and we trust certain things. We trust a man in a suit rather than a man in, the, in his pajamas. Uh, it's, it, you know, it's, got, it's the same man, <laughs> you know? Um, and, you know, it, so we, we, we transfer these things to trust which are unrelated, but that's what you're trying to do. And especially if you have something valuable to sell that people don't appreciate the value of, you have to do everything possible to move them in the direction of doing the best thing for themselves. Cause they don't want to buy life insurance. They don't want to exercise. They don't want to eat right. They don't want to save money. They want to buy a fancy car. They want to go to Las Vegas, right? They want to buy ridiculously expensive watches that that, that they don't have, nobody has to talk them into that yep. right uh they're 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 walking in the store you know trying to figure out how they're gonna you know find room in a credit card yep you know so, you, you're bringing up some great great points you know and, and particularly you know taking a step back and regarding the branding piece you know i always think about like nike in branding because nike as a company they actually don't make anything they really are a marketing company Right. They, yeah. they, they sell you on a product. They put their logo on, but they don't actually make that product. <laughs> right? They, they sell you yeah. on the story. And then one of the things you mentioned too, with the dentists kind of creating, you know, um, upgrading their, their area and patients sending money I actually read, I think it was on the wall street journal just this week, McDonald's did something similar where McDonald's was actually giving away fractional shares of McDonald's. They did a little test study. And so they actually gave away fractional shares of McDonald's stock as a reward for actually buying uh, at McDonald's. And what happened is the consumers that received those fractional share stock purchased, their, their purchasing went up 150% because they created that loyalty, right? That brand yeah. loyalty. And, and yeah. it was so novel. I thought that was the coolest, coolest thing. And then one of the things you mentioned too is, you know, the segments for radio time being 29 seconds and, and TV or TV, radio 55, TV 29. But that's also important for these entrepreneurs to understand and anybody listening to this podcast to understand you, your first impression is a professional. You have that 30 second elevator speech. Refine yeah. that 30 second elevator speech. When, if you have an opportunity to get in front of the CEO of the company that you finally want to work with or the division that you want to be a part, that 30 second elevator speech is imperative, right? To have it you, you, to your point, you shouldn't take 20 minutes to explain what you do. If you, if you take 20 minutes to explain what you're doing, then you actually may not know exactly what you're doing well enough. You know? Yeah. Well, that's an Einstein quote. If you can't, if you can't explain something in 30 seconds, you don't understand it. Yep. Um, but the problem is most entrepreneurs know too much about their business. So they can't, so they forget the beginning that you need, everybody needs to understand because they're, they're, 90 yards down the field with their business so they're talking about well you know it's all written in cobol and and like and, and it and it loads at you know uh, you know 10 megabytes per second it's like i don't care right <laughs> i don't know what you're talking about i don't know what i'm getting right <laughs> like oh it helps you find a girlfriend online now you're talking yeah and now i get it it's a yep. dating site yeah why is it a good dating site Oh, because the women get to choose instead of the men. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. And I'm, I'm 10 seconds in and I've, I've set two hooks Yeah. <laughs> because they say, oh, I get that it's a, it's a problem I might have. And, yeah. I, and then don't worry about it. if they don't have the problem, you, you move on. Right. But you don't know if they got the problem until you tell them what problem you solve. That, that's very true. So now, you know, you mentioned you've written a couple of books before, right? You, you, you've done yeah. Super Bold and you've written some other books in the dentistry. How difficult was it to write a book? Um, you know, it's hard for me to say because advertising turned me into a writer. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I, you know, it, it taught me how to write with discipline. It taught me how to be super concise. And, and 
listenable or watchable or readable because we did a ton of print ads too. So uh, the first book I did, I, I, it was based on my lectures. So the first thing I did was set up a video camera, recorded for six hours straight. I just talked you know, with a couple of breaks, of course. And I had people in my office come in and say, be an audience for me. You can come and go. I don't care. I'm just trying to get everything that comes into my head recorded. Right. And, and, and then transcribed it all. And it was my first draft. So now I got something to work with and I start chopping through it and I go, Oh, this belongs here. And these are the three sections. This is how it's going to flow. And now I go chapter by chapter by chapter and clean it up. Um, and then the final phase, actually, when you're self-publishing, which is what I did, is to record the audio book before you go to press, oh, okay. because um, you'll read it out loud. I remember distinctly reading Everything is Marketing, and I'm reading this paragraph, and I'm saying to myself, this means the opposite of what I'm trying to say here. What <laughs> happened, right? And I reread the paragraph and I go like, oh, this is where this got transposed. So I got to fix it. And also the other thing that you learn, and this is, this is what people are doing more and more with audiobooks, is they're not a slave to the text. If it's their book, they just change it. I mean, I'm listening to Brene Brown's new book, uh, Atlas of the Heart, and she says, Okay, because you're listening to the book, you if, if you were reading it, you probably would have reread this. So I'm going to say it again, slowly. And I thought, that's brilliant, right? Because I am listening to it. And it's like, yeah. wait, 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 what did she yeah. say? I'm riding my bike. And I just looked at the, at the guy coming at me. I, I missed it. Like, and I'm not going to rewind right, while I'm on right. my bike. Um, or, or on the treadmill or wherever else people are listening to stuff or 40 feet from the, the speaker. Um, so that to to understand and that's something really basic understand how people are using your medium how are they using facebook how are they using instagram how are they using tiktok tiktok where are they using it where is where is part of how yep you know uh, uh, you know if if 70% of of searches are originating on your cell or on a cell phone originating on a cell phone your website better play perfectly in mobile format. Yeah. You can say, no, no, it needs all of this wide frame stuff. Good for you. <laughs> yeah. Except that's not how the medium's being used. Very true. Yeah. You know, I, that's exactly what I'm kind of going through with the shades of entrepreneurship. 76% of the individuals that, you know, listen to it, listen to on mobile. And they also utilize their phone for, you know, accessing the webpage. And so that's, it's so important. In fact, one of the things you mentioned you know, you, you essentially wrote your book off of previous, you know, information discussions you have. And that's, that's kind of a very important thing that for the listeners to know, a lot of you folks at home may have already written a book. If, if you blog, right. If you, you just put all that information and consolidate it. In fact, that's exactly what I'm doing. I'm, I'm, I'm putting together my first ebook called the beginning line. It's, it's really going to take people through how to start a business here in Oregon, kind of step-by-step -step process, how to create an idea, talk about addressing a problem, not creating a solution for a problem. Right. And, yeah. and really, and, but really it is, is a consolidation of a lot of these blog posts that I have been writing for this podcast. Cause I'm like, Hey, I have all this content. Let's bridge it into one. Right. Well, and that's, and that's what my second book was called becoming remarkable, how to create a dental practice. Everyone talks about. And I was meaning the, the word remarkable figuratively and literally in that we want them to remark about you because when they do it now, mm, it's done digitally nice. and it's likable and shareable and searchable and permanent. Yeah. And so that book was a compilation of three years of blogs that I had written that I just organized and yep. rewrote and lengthened and shortened and, and sequenced. But that th my content was there. 90% of my content for the second book was already written. It just needed to be reorganized and and connected yep and so yeah that's your repurpose your content you don't you don't need a whole new idea every time it's you just true. need to articulate it well in fact you don't even need for those inspiring entrepreneurs 
you don't even need a new idea. You can actually go with an idea that is already out there and just make it better. You know, yeah. look at digital everything, right? Think digital first for everything because that's kind of where we're going to. In fact, you know, one of the things I, I was reading your bio, you've actually danced stand up improv and some acting in the past. Now, yeah. Uh, I mean, that was part of my boldness process was yeah. I wanted, I wanted, I had to do stuff that terrified me. Stand up <laughs> terrified me. Improv comedy terrified me. But improv, the, the training I did, I studied five years with the Groundlings in Los Angeles. And that was probably the best life skill training I ever picked up because you learn to develop the skill very gradually, non-verbally at the very beginning because people say how the hell can you walk on a stage and create a scene with three people uh how do, you know how is that possible and you go well it's not possible if you think you're just going to walk out there and do it you have to understand the rules and the and the and the and the techniques and and you have to do it enough where you trust your creativity and then when it starts to happen you develop this incredible trust that you will come up with something if you just relax, pay attention and listen and stop trying to think about how am I gonna create the whole scene? You're not, you're gonna create a piece of it. But once you learn to go on stage with no material and make people laugh and draw people in, going on stage prepared is easy. <laughs> um, but, and, and what happened is I took all of that, that improv system and that's how I created the exercises in Super Bowl, because a third of Super Bowl as a book are is five levels of exercises to build your boldness muscle and, and expand your confidence, starting very, very simply and easily, but then building up and building up till you're doing what you never imagined you could. And it, it, so I, I used all the same principles of improv because I, I knew how well they work. And, and that, and that, like I said, that, that the improv, and I've talked to other people who've done improv too. And they say, yeah, I don't, I'm not in the improv or comedy world at all, but it affects my relationships, how I meet people at parties, how I network with key people and, you know, and how I, how I pitch my business, how I raise money. It affects everything because I'm, I know how to not just be confident about what I have. I know how to project that confidence because boldness is your confidence in action that's the that's the transformation you can feel i'm very confident about my product really because you sound like a babbling idiot when you talk about <laughs> it and, you, and you're not even you're not even making eye contact right it's like doesn't you don't seem confident at all about your product you need to project the confidence that yeah. you actually feel about your product because you're going oh well i'm not good in front of people well guess what get good yeah. You know, you want to run a business, get good at being in front of people. Yeah. Nobody, you know, I, I tell people, um, I can train you and to be customer service. It's not something everybody's born with, but I can train you, right? I can train you. A lot of people get trained to do all these things, right? Like, like Toastmasters, right? If you have issues with yeah. public speaking, join Toastmasters, get out there. And, and, um, if the best way to grow is to get outside of your experience or get, it gets out outside of your comfort zone. Right. And, and that yeah. sounds like oh, that's yeah. exactly what you did. And, do stuff. You, it's not, you can't just read about it. You can yes. read 50 books on public speaking. You'll be 2% better. Toastmasters, <laughs> you'll be 50% better in three months. Yeah. You know, because yeah. you're in an entirely supportive environment and you're doing it. And then you watch a video of yourself and you go, what am I doing? Right. Why did I say, um, at the start of every <laughs> sentence, right? Why am I pinching my nose at the end of every sentence? What is wrong with me? Right. And you never knew you did any of those things. You'd and they're be all surprised. Nervous yeah. It's, yeah. it's kind of funny uh, when you watch yourself and you start noticing these little tidbits that you do like, what the heck am I doing? <laughs> right. But yeah, let go of your nose, you know, stop pulling your ear. What are you doing? What? Look up, look up, stop looking down. You know, it's like yeah. you can coach yourself. Yeah. You know, it's like you just, but that see part of boldness is that willingness to, to take feedback. It's, you know, it takes boldness to give people honest feedback as a leader, but it takes real boldness to take criticism, hard yeah. criticism. And I true. tell people that all the time. I said, when I speak and people come up and say, that was great. That was the best thing I ever heard. Or I never knew that. It just changed me to understand that. I had an epiphany. It was like, wonderful to hear. 
I want to hear the guy who said, I don't get it. Right. Or you annoyed the heck out of me because you did this. I had a guy come up to me and said, you'd be a lot better if you didn't curse. And, and, and I, and I'm thinking, I was like, did I curse? <laughs> and, uh, and he said, I said, what did I say? He said, you said shit. Oh, and I said, get the F out of here. What are you talking about? <laughs> like, 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 shit. I said, shit. What are you five? You know, but, but it, it, but in my mind, it was a lesson because it was like, yeah. never forget that somebody in the audience, if I could have said crap and I'd have been fine. Yeah. Right. If I lose 10% of the audience because I said shit and now they're not listening anymore, that's a fail, yeah, right? Cool. Because it's unnecessary, right? I can fix it like that. So fix it. And that's, so you got to get, seek the feedback, take the, you know, get the blood bath, right? Yeah. And because that's how you get better. Success doesn't teach you very much. Failure. Failure teaches you a lot. You know, yep. I, I tell these folks every time I've, I've never failed a day in my life. I either learn or I stop doing it. <laughs> like, let's fail. Right. It felt like saying failure is like, I'm done. I'm not going to do it. Right. So I either, I either learn or I succeed because I'm going to keep trying to learn until I succeed. So I'm going to do one of the two. Well, and this is, this is the thing that bold people knew or know naturally. Uh, they know a bunch of things, but one of the things that I learned is that from doing it, is there's almost as much satisfaction in trying and not succeeding as there is in trying and succeeding. The only time you really don't feel good is when you didn't try, when you just, ah, and, yeah. and, and, and the window closed, right? The opportunity disappeared. And sometimes it's important. Sometimes it's, uh, it's a business person you really wanted to meet or an actor you really admire that, that, that there was an opportunity to walk over and say, I really love your work. And I don't need a selfie. I don't need anything with you. I just, I, I just wanted you to know that I'm so moved by, by your performances. You think they're gonna say, get out of my face from that? No, they're gonna say, get out of my face. And she goes, I, wanna, I can't remember your name, but I know you were in like the James Bond movies. Can, can we get a selfie? Now they want you out of their face, yeah, right? Because you don't know how to behave. Right. It's like you don't you can't calmly go and meet who you want to meet. This is this is the power of being bold is to be able to meet whomever you want to meet whenever you want to that to do that as a business person transformational because that one mentor, that one customer, that one business guy is going to say, no, no, no. You don't want private equity money for your business. You want mezzanine finance. And you'd say, just say, what's mezzanine finance? <laughs> and they explain it. And then you go do that and you maintain control of your business instead of going with private equity. Now, that's obviously a narrow example. But I, the number of times people have said one thing to me that was worth a hundred grand, I've lost track of. That, 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 that they sent me that, that I steered around a giant pothole or, or I went left when I was going, in, I was sure that going right was the way yeah. because they had the experience. So to be able to meet people, to cultivate that ability to meet whoever you want, whenever you want, and to step up, to speak up. Sometimes you want to speak up because somebody's saying something, somebody's saying uh, you know, a, a, a racially slanted joke. You want to be able to say to them, "That's not funny anymore, buddy." Yeah. You know, you need to you need to bury those for all good. It's not 1955 anymore. Okay. Yep. Um, and you because you and you want to say that, or you want to defend somebody. You yeah. know, I I get a real issue with bullies, and I I step right up to them if I see somebody bullying somebody verbally or whatever. It's like you need to stop this. That's right. when the curse words come out. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Sometimes they're parenthetical until they're not, you know. Uh, but but it, but I don't do it like ragefully. I just say I'm calm. Yeah. And it, which and I'm but I'm projecting. I'm also not afraid of you, right? Yeah. Um, I'm 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 uh, what you're doing is unacceptable, and I'm not, uh, you know. And they'll say, "Who the hell are you to tell me?" It's like a human being. That's who yeah. I am. Sensible and your behavior is unacceptable and you live in society and you need to stop this. Yep. 
You know, you know, Maya and, Angelou has a great quote. Um, she she said, "Some people will never remember what you did or said, but they will always remember the way you made them feel." And you know, this is yeah. this is a testament to everybody listening. We we're all going through a pandemic. I'm not sure, Fred. This is this is my first pandemic. Is this your first pandemic you've been through? Yeah, yeah. I, I missed all the others. <laughs> I missed all the other ones as well. And so we're all going through different things at, you know, and, and different times. And you mentioned bullying. And I think that's kind of a big area right now where a lot of people are, are struggling. Right. And, and um, there's a lot of inaccuracies information. Everybody just take a moment and understand everybody has a backstory. You don't know the backstory, but one thing you can do is make them feel better. And, and yep. I would, I would challenge everybody and say, you know, as may Angela, I mentioned, you know, they may not remember how you, what you said or did, but they'll remember how you made them feel how do you as an individual want to be remembered how you made people feel? Right? Yeah. Think about that. Now, now let's talk, let's kick it back to the business because you mentioned financing. You know, I would love to mm. kind of talk about how did you get into the financing world? Did you do venture capital? Is it, is it grassroots? Explain. Uh, that. We, this, this comes down to entrepreneurial lessons. There's, there's two things that'll kill your business, not enough money and too much money. Because if you have not enough money, you can't get to that. You can't get to the market, right? Correct. And you're or you underspend in your advertising or whatever. If you get too much money, you throw money at problems rather than creativity. Good point. And so you don't figure out what's really wrong. You're you're actually burying the problem with cash. Um, and so we were very lucky. We didn't have a lot of cash, um, and so and we had no borrowing power. And we had no credit with the TV stations for years. Uh, so we had to figure out how to generate cash flow. So we get we figured out all these little things when we charge when we signed up a dentist uh, for the monthly fee, we charged them first and last. Now that makes no sense, right? Then why they should pay first and last, technically, except we were sales guys. So we we told them this is what we do. That way, if you decide to end the program, you've already paid your last month right? Nothing wrong with doing it. It's not, we, it wasn't criminal what we did, but what it was cash flow. Yeah. And Massive cash flow. Cash flow. We, we eventually had a, a, a million plus in deposits, essentially last month's payment. That was our working capital. So we never had to borrow money. And then, and, and the bank, that we used, we had a really great small bank that they completely understood our business model. Cause they said, look, I, I, we said, we, we don't hang on to a lot of cash. We don't have any assets, but we spend $500,000 a month in advertising. At any given moment, if, if we need to make a, a loan payment to you and we don't have it sitting in the bank, we spend $400,000 that month. And now we've got a hundred for you because we can coast for a month because we'll come right back in with the spending. We have built, you know, we've run for two years in this market. We can, we can drop 20, 25% of our spending and we'll, the propulsion will ca carry us over. We may lose 5%, maybe 10% of the calls. Then we can make it up in, in the next month. So they lent us way more money than the average service business would get. So we always cultivated these relationships. And then eventually we were at that juncture where we wanted to buy another company. And my partner wanted to be bought out. He had gone passive for a few years. So we were debating mezzanine financing and private equity. And it was a, it, it was a 51 49 decision. It wasn't like easy. Now, can you, can you uh, explain the difference a little bit between those two for the listeners? The yeah, so private, private equity comes in and puts money into the business, their money into the business for equity. They'll take some percentage of ownership. Most of the time, they want a majority ownership, but unless, unless you're super successful. And they're also doing it if you're, if you're planning on exiting at some point, like I was five. I said, look, I want to build the business and, and exit but I want to build it more with your money. Mezzanine financing is you're borrowing the money for whatever you need. And it has a, a, an interest rate. Let's say, let's call it, let's say you borrow a million dollars and you're going to pay 
8% interest on that for up to 10 years. You can pay off the note anytime you want because the, still, the plan is still, you're going to sell the business somewhere down the line, pay off the note. Within that financing is the base interest rate of 8%, but there's an internal rate of return, as they call it, an IRR, which is they want to make 20% on their money every year. You just don't have to pay them till you sell the business. So if you think you can grow the business fast enough, then, then paying $200,000 a year on that accruing on that note is not a big deal. If you borrowed a million dollars, you'll owe them $2 million at the end of five years, but maybe you've increased the value of your business $10 million in the sale. So, uh, and the same thing happens with the private equity. You bring money in knowing that you maybe you've only got 40% left, but that 40% is worth four times what it was when you brought in private equity when you sell it. Now, that's if everything goes right. If everything goes wrong, they eat you alive, okay? And you're, and you're, you're left standing in your underwear in Times Square. You got nothing. <laughs> uh, and uh, you're the, the uh, naked cowboy with your guitar. Yeah, and uh, I think I don't know if you... it, it's important for folks to know at home is venture capitalists, they want their money back. <laughs> yeah, they're there. And, and the, the thing is, their purpose is to make money. Money is their God, right? Yep. They don't, your business, my business, my purpose was to make sure my dentist clients had a, had a full schedule. That was concisely our purpose for the business. It was not, our purpose is not to get rich. That core values weren't get rich, get richer, get richest, right? Those were not the three core values. Profit comes from doing your purpose and fulfilling it. Venture capital's purpose is make more money by giving people money. So everything they look at is about the money. Are you, are you, you're, are you throwing it off a of profit? Are you growing? And as long as you're growing and throwing off profit, they leave you completely alone. But if not, they are up your butt about everything. Why are you paying so much for cell phone coverage? It's like, really? We're going to look at the cell phone bill as uh, uh, at the board meeting, but th that's what they're going to do. And they're going to say, nope, you shouldn't do that. And, and they'll have written in their, in their agreement, if you reach a, a certain point of failure, they get to take over the business. Yeah. And you won't like that. Yeah. Well, let's let's talk about the, the difficulties a little bit of, of starting a business. What has been hard about, you know, starting a business or, or maintaining your current business? Um, finding the best people is always the biggest problem. And uh, firing the wrong people too slowly is the second biggest problem. Because uh, you go, well, I need somebody there in that position. Actually, nobody would be better than somebody subpar. Um, we hire our friends. We hire people. We say, well, this guy needs a job. That's not a reason to give somebody a job is your friend needs a job. I've done it so many <laughs> times. I've lost track. 80% of the time, they disappoint me. Um, and I feel like such a nice guy for having done it. Um, it's, you know, build a team, build a sports team with the right player in the right position and bench them or cut them as soon as they're not playing full out. That's, and that's, and recruiting is so hard because you're just, you need people constantly. And you either, uh, you either become a micromanager because you go, oh, I could do this better. And you're, and you never have enough time for any thinking about your business and being creative because it's too busy managing and micromanaging and doing a lot of stuff yourself or you delegate to the point where you're not paying attention yep. and you've got B players all over the place and instead of saying you know if you're going to delegate delegate to a, a superstar delegate to strong people and grow them and that's yeah, you know the best businesses people I've seen is that's all and that's what we did we grew people everywhere they knew it. I was, I was always trying to find somebody smarter than me, better at that than whatever the hell I was doing. Yes. Yes. And I will say, you know, admittedly, that's kind of the difficulties of being a small business owner is you kind of have to be the jack of all trades when you're starting out, because it's important to understand if you're going to ask somebody to do something, 
you have to have at least a baseline knowledge of what they're doing so you can ensure they're doing it properly, right? Or, or doing it to your level of expertise. That's you got to, yeah, you got to set the specs. It's, you gotta, it's your, you got to set yeah. the, the key performance indicators of the, down the road because, and you can only do that when you know what the actual things exactly. are. Exactly. Yep. Exactly. Now, now, Fred, what motivates you? What motivates you to keep going? Uh, impact, if I could say it in one word. I, I want to have as much impact on the world in general and people in particular in specific individually as I can for as long as I live whether it's helping them be a better businessman or a better mate or a bolder person or a bolder parent or a parent who helps their kid to be more confident and bold and and give them the tools to do that or to just you know when I'm coaching entrepreneurs to just say you don't have to hit the same potholes I hit hit new ones yes and, and we'll accelerate you on this path or we'll find out the market doesn't care. And, yep. that, and that may be what I'm going to tell you is like the market is speaking to you. You need a massive pivot or you need to call this one and start another business. It doesn't mean you failed. It just means you went to school. Yes. You know, right. Yes. Guess what? You paid tuition. Don't we all? It's, I had some of the some of the business courses I took were half a million dollars. Okay. I didn't, I didn't sign up for that, but that was the actual cost of the lesson. Yep. Yeah. You, you can't, you can't be afraid to kind of pull the plug on something that's not working. You know, uh, yeah. it, it is kind of true. Now as a business owner, what are, what are some of the things that keep you up at night? I've always been the kind of guy that nothing keeps me up at night. I, like I, I, I go to bed with a problem and wake up with a solution. Uh, right. And, and that's, and, and that's just perspective and just, just realize that, in the end, it's it's just life, right? If you fail completely and utterly, and I've been so broke, I didn't have money to put gas in my car. Uh, and I wasn't unhappy. I was just broke. And I figured out my way up. And I got we got in some real tight spots over the course of 30 years. That's what's going to happen. And you get to the point where you, you go like, wow, we're, we're 30 days from doomed. Or if this guy doesn't give us credit, we're in real trouble. And you just wake up every morning and, and find a way and use your team. The, the, my biggest weakness was not being a good collaborator at the beginning. And once I learned to collaborate, I went, oh, wow, I don't have to carry all this load up, my, up the hill by myself. Yep. And that's what allowed me to go to sleep. I said, we're going we're gonna to get up and we're gonna, we're gonna, the whole team's going to throw full weight at, at this problem. We're going to figure it out. We're not going to figure it out. If we don't figure it out, we start over. Yeah. Yeah. It's very, very, yeah. very true. You know, this back to one of the things you mentioned, the potholes, you know, for the listeners, I really hope you use this podcast as a pothole avoider, right? <laughs> Listen to the entrepreneurs it's telling their stories. These are successful entrepreneurs who've been doing this for years and they're here providing you free education to really help you as an individual succeed in this world of entrepreneurism, right? Uh, and there is no right way to do a business. There's multiple ways, right? And there's multiple ways to be successful, but certainly hear from some of these professionals that have done it in the past. They're giving you some really good advice of like, Hey, be mindful of this. Now you're continuing to, you're still on the road. You're still grinding. You're still doing books. How do you continue to build your brand and continue to market? One of the things we actually were talking about before we jumped on was uh, the SOE, right? The, the website development and, and things of that nature. How do you continue to build your brand and market? You know, it's, it's being in front of people. Sometimes it's just taking that extra 45 seconds with somebody or the minute it takes to answer an email from someone. Um, and then and then just and to, to be a presence, to, to articulate clearly what I'm doing. I, I've talked several times in this podcast about my book, which is something I'm passionate about that can help people, right? But I'm not... I'm not reading from the book like we're at a book reading. Right. I'm, I'm, I'm saying, I'm just giving you bits and pieces so that you're curious enough to say, I think that's what I want to know. Because I'm a big believer, if you, if you read 30 pages of my book and it doesn't resonate, put it the heck down, right? Um, because book, the right book finds you when you need it. I have, this has happened to me 50 times. And, and there are books that I've started and and just put them down and said, this guy's full of it. It just like makes no sense. 
And then three years later or five years later, pick it up and go like, where was all this great content the first yeah. time? <laughs> it was right there in the book. I was not, the, the student was not ready. Exactly. Uh, yeah. So, and we're all students. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And, and, you know, we, we need to learn and we need to unlearn constantly. That is, that is the story of our lives at this point. Everything's changing too fast. I could tell you what to do on Facebook today, but if you watch this two years from now and apply that, you're making a terrible mistake. It's very true. And even in the healthcare world, I could tell you what to do with COVID two years ago, but it's completely different than what we're doing today. Right. And, yep. and, it, and that's just because we're learning, we're evolving, we're getting smarter, right? We're starting to understand things and we're getting advice. Now, now speaking of advice, what advice would you give the listeners at home? What's some, what advice would you give me? How do, how can I continue to market and brand? How, how do we grow? How do we be super bold? Uh, sharpen your ability to connect with people. That means your communication is about creating a true connection with whomever you interact with. And sometimes it's making, just making that person feel better about themselves. It's sometimes it's just being interested in what that person is about, what they've done, what they have to say, rather than being interested in telling them something. Yes. And so develop this skill and it, and it takes boldness and confidence to, to meet people and shut up and listen and say, wow, you know, uh, that's really interesting what you've done. Tell me more about that. The, the power of tell me more is amazing. And so talk to strangers. If I had to sum it up, you want to develop a, a core life skill, talk to strangers every day. Why is networking so important? Because human beings have stuff for you and you don't know what it is. And if you go approach everyone without uh, being concerned about the outcome at all, that your only desire is to connect, that's when the magic happens. When you, when you're, when you have an outcome, when you have a need, that becomes apparent very quickly that you're you're trying to connect because you're oh i need to i need money i need a referral i need this i need you as a customer it's all very obvious it's like you're you're the desperate guy at the dance right yeah, you radiate desperation yeah. right so none of the girls are going to dance with you um if you just say i want to make this girl feel great about what she's wearing i want to make this guy feel good about how good a dancer he is if that's all you're thinking about Suddenly you create, you draw people to you. That's why, I mean, the, the subtitle of my book is from underconfident to charismatic in 90 days. Charisma is just radiating that you are comfortable wherever you are. And that draws people to you. Yep. And that's because you know how to relax. You know how to connect. You know how to be interested in people. And you know how to chase your dreams and not let anybody stop you. Yes. You know, and, and if you're listening and you're working in the healthcare world, I'm going to give you a, a great, great little tidbit. When you're going into a community and you're wanting to extract referral volume from that community, address the community needs first before yours. And that's how you'll get referral volume. Because if you address their needs, because to your point, Fred, if you go in there with, hey, these, these are my problems, these are my needs, they're going to just show you out the door. They don't care. They don't care about your problems or needs. They have their own problems and needs. Listen to them. Focus on their problems and needs. Once you have addressed those, they're going to help address your problems and needs, right? Because you created the synergy, that, that loyalty. Now, Fred, for the folks at home, how do they get in contact with you? Where's your social media? How do they buy your book? Give them their contact information. Okay, so I'm Fred Joyle everywhere because I'm a marketing guy. So I've had, I got my name on Facebook and, and Twitter and Instagram and TikTok, and LinkedIn. I am Fred Joyle. And my website, oddly enough, is fredjoyle.com. Uh, and Super Bold is available in hardcover, uh, and Audible, and Kindle, all on Amazon. Um, and you can download the, uh, the first chapter for free on fredjoyle.com. I'm also doing a two-day workshop uh, I don't know when this podcast is coming out, but it's June 24th and 25th. Perfect. And, uh, and uh, it's a two-day accelerated program for, for those people who go like, 
I'm ready to, to put the pedal to the metal here and really bust out of my comfort zone. Uh, it's, I'm limiting it to 40 people. Um, we're doing it in Santa Monica, California. It will transform you and give you the tools you need to just chase your dreams with confidence and boldness and get bolder and bolder and bolder the rest of your life. I'm getting bolder and bolder all the time. And I'm just a bold introvert making my way through the world. But anybody can do it. Uh, anybody can learn it. And that's, uh, you know, if there's, if there's one or two of your listeners that say, no, no, I don't want to just read the book. I, I want this to happen now. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, if you're feeling that urgency, come on down. I we'll like have it. some fun. And well, this episode will air before that. So I'll make sure to uh, promote that as well. Fred Joyle, thank you so much. I'm feeling super bold after this conversation. And in fact, I might just go watch super bad after this because it just started. Yes. I might as well, right? Irresistible, yeah. Right. It's irresistible. Yeah. Man, thank you so much. A phenomenal conversation. Like you, I'm a marketer, so I'm the shades of E everywhere. So TikTok, Facebook, LinkedIn. I even got the shades of E.com. In fact, please do not try to use the shades of E because I have it now trademarked. It is now mine. So we got it <laughs> nice. all. So Fred, thank you so much for taking the time. I really do appreciate it. I'm certainly going to grab the book and, and dive into it. I'm, I'm usually more of a, a hands-on person because I like to actually do some highlighters. I'm one of those people. I still think I'm in school. So I, I highlight my <laughs> textbooks all the time. But thank you so much for the time. For the folks listening at home, please join me or please follow me or subscribe on the podcast, The Shades of Entrepreneurship. You can also subscribe to the newsletter on theshadesofe.com and you can find us on all the social sites at The Shades of E. Thank you and have a great night.